um, fairly useful actually. I mean, on a, a personal level, I use NHS choices quite a lot. Um, I recall my husband was recently complaining that he had a problem, and it turned out he had a hernia. So I was actually, and I was actually able to self-diagnose that from going on to NHS choices. Um, living in Manchester, I work in a professional capacity with clinical commissioning groups. So I do know, for example, that the uh, clinical commissioning groups in Manchester have what they call a Choose Well website, where people can actually go on to access information, whether it's about um, dental services, the GP, but also symptoms as well and where they should go to access help. So that's quite useful and I do tend to refer uh, people to that site as well. Um, I'm a community empowerment worker um, and that means that I actually work with black and other minority groups across the city of Manchester to focus on particular, their particular health needs, um, issues that they may have when they're trying to access health services. Um, and one of the things that I always tend to find is that when it comes to um, BME groups, that they prefer information that's face-to-face. -face. And I think that's particularly important when you actually look at certain conditions that um, are more likely to relate to certain groups. So, for example, you know, you actually have a higher rate of prostate cancer within black men. Um, so Prostate Cancer UK are really good in that they actually have materials that are specifically targeted to that group, which is really, really good. But I think in terms of getting the information across to black men, you have to deal with that issue face to face. And the you know, paper documents are used to kind of support what's actually told to them. I think first of all that it's, it's tailored. Um, so there's an understanding then of, of you know, that particular client group. Secondly, it must be clear, simple language, no jargon. Um, I think with some groups you need to consider the whole issue of do, should information be translated. It's not always necessary, but you know, questions need to be asked as to whether certain groups want information to be translated. And then there's this whole issue of um, literacy. Um, you don't necessarily always, certain groups don't necessarily always want materials that's in a paper form. It could well be they want to watch a, a DVD, so that's a, something to consider. But I think it's when you see information where there's an awful lot of jargon in it that, that, that you know that if it's somebody from a CCG or from a health trust can understand it, um, and it may not have been um, tested to ensure that it's in plain English, you know, I mean, that's of no use whatsoever, or, or it can be... Um, Quite, quite detailed sort of clinical sort of clinical information in it which the ordinary person on the street won't necessarily understand. I mean that's of limited use really. Um, I think because, because the focus of my work is with black and other minority groups, I mean I do think that there are many organisations who, who don't really consider um, their needs um, and I think that that's something that really needs to be considered when materials are actually being produced and also the whole issue of Yes, you know, face to face is best. Um, it does take an up, take up an awful lot of time, but actually, it's more effective at the end.